Hello, everybody. Hello, uh, and welcome. Welcome to the uh, New Poetry Society. Um, it's live, and uh, we should be here for about an hour. Um, thanks you for joining me. And uh, this is uh, an event as part of the Nottingham Poetry Festival, and uh, it's backed by Inspire, who are um, the uh, people who sort out the libraries in Nottinghamshire and um, uh, Nottingham County Council, the Arts Council. Um, all the technical stuff is done at Metronome and uh, Confetti. Uh, so there's a lot of people behind it, and um, uh, here to bring it to you for your pleasure. So uh, thank you for letting us into your home. Um, so we're going to do an hour. I've got a special guest. This is the fourth one I've done. Um, if you've not seen the first three, they will be up on the website for uh, Inspire. And you can, if you type in New Poetry Society and Inspire, um, you can see the first one uh, with Bridie Spires. Bridie Squires. Uh, um, so uh, do check that out. Today, um, I've got a, a great special guest. Um, we will be asking him some questions, uh, or you'll be asking him some questions uh, later. And we've got a chat facility down the side of the screen, and we've got a Q&A facility. But that'll be about halfway through, so about half an hour in. Um, so please join me uh, and welcome um, a great poet from uh, Nottingham, um, a great writer. Uh, I know he does uh, work in schools and uh, workshops, um, and he's also um, a cinephile. So please welcome Andrew Graves. Hi, Andrew, how are you doing? Can you hear us okay? Yes, yes, can you hear me? Um, but yeah, fine, thanks. Cinephile, what's a cinephile? <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't know if I, 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 I'm, I'm just someone who's always been obsessed with films from an early age. I guess, I guess it's because, um, unlike this generation, which is a, you know, completely different generation, I guess growing up with like three channels, I think you, I ended up accessing things that had there been channels that were specifically aimed at me as a kid. I would never have access, but because I grew up in the sort of seventies when you had limited access to things and no internet and no video, um, I ended up, you know, as you know, so I first saw those kind of Boris Karloff films or Bela Lugosi films or you know, Some Like It Hot by Marilyn Monroe. So I've always been fascinated by it, and um, you know, like with poetry, I've always um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to earn part of my living from it. So I, as well as doing poetry, I, I write for lots of magazines. I write lots of essays for Blu-rays and things like that. So that's 90% um, of what I do is, is writing about films, really. So uh, I love it. Oh, great, great. No, I, I used to, uh, as you say, uh, um, scout round, scour round for uh, things to watch because uh, you'd only got uh, well, three channels. I mean, I was, I, I go back far enough for two channels. <laughs> and because um, we, weren't, we weren't posh enough to buy the extra uh, um, aerial that you needed for BBC Two at start. Um, we used to look down the road to see, see who, was, uh, who got some money. Um, but uh, I remember at Christmas, you get the, um, the Radio Times and you'd look uh, over the Christmas period uh, all the gems that were there, and I, I'm a big fan of the Marx Brothers, so I, I'd always look for, they, they'd have the Marx Brothers on at like um, seven o'clock in the morning or half 11 at night, and, and I'd, I'd seek them out and uh, and watch as many as I could and uh, all sorts of things. So as you say, it, it seemed more eclectic back then because things weren't uh, targeted for you. They didn't have the al algorithms that uh, I think they call them these days that uh, confine us. Well, we, I mean, we were kind of, you know, well, my generation was like the last one to have a foothold in the past, I think. Because so, so we might have got brand new TV shows aimed at kids like Bag Pulse, Mr. Ben, and all that stuff. It was yeah. often sandwiched in between stuff that might have been 40, 30 years old, like Charlie Chaplin yeah. repeats or Laurel and Hardy. So the past never seemed like history to me. It just seemed like something I grew up with. Yeah, I, I found uh, when BBC Three started, we made a lot of programmes for BBC Three uh, as I was a TV producer at the time, and they were trying to get a lot of representation of young people. And I remember thinking, 
it didn't bother me at all that my heroes were, you know, uh, people in their um, late 50s. I mean, um, um, Phil Silvers um, in yeah. Milko uh, was probably my ultimate hero. Um, you know, the fact that he was American, the fact that he was, he, he was old, it didn't occur to me. He was just, um, you know, somebody trying to, trying to get by. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've always been the same. You know, e even extending to music and things like that. A lot of my musical heroes are people that were making stuff before I was born. You know, and beyond. And I, I it's not that I'm not. I don't engage with new stuff because I definitely do. I think, in fact, you know, in terms of films, I mean, I love horror films and cult films are my kind of thing. Um, and I would say that out of everything in the 21st century, the best thing about the 21st century is its horror films. We've had some amazing horror films. In <laughs> Absolutely brilliant stuff. Well, I, I know they passed my wife goodbye because she, she won't watch an horror film. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, she's got an old world to discover. Um, now, uh, of course, we're here um, because of poetry. Uh, and uh, I've seen you perform many times and perform with you many times. Uh, um, um, you've got some brilliant uh, poems. You've got a new book uh, out. Um, uh, can you give us a poem to start us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a poem. This is from my last book. Um, I will do some stuff from my new book uh, later. But yeah, it's. Uh, I should also say that it's, today is my uh, 20th wedding so uh, I'm going to dedicate this one to uh, my lovely Mrs. Anna. Uh, this is called uh, Pecan Flippers. It's just a turtle. Pecans for flippers. Dark praline, golden sweet, melting in cafe warmth. Its shell a rippled candy truth. Seeing the world through sugared eyes. She places it before me, a kiss above the china pot, lovers seen framed in latte steam, the chit-chat and the tinkled spoons form an improv romance score. Outside the town is what it is, a worried, sulking, sour face, an upturned bin of chaos spilled across the lunchtime's bitter rush. No moments kept in shiny foil, no bruise to warm the casual heart. Drag ghosts haunt the waking shade of the clock tower's disapproving glance. Outside the town is what it is. Inside we sit with our palace of cups. Chapped hands touch under tabled hope, caressing smooth on certain years. Melting in the cafe warmth, we are a rippled candy truth, seeing the world through sugared eyes. Oh, that's lovely, that is. That's, that, that's lovely. And uh, I, I love um, your imagery. There, there's sort of hints of all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, there's a, a darkness there, which uh, uh, probably uh, reflects your love of um, uh, horror films and stuff. But there, there's a sort of um, what I might call a, a kitchen sink, um, almost 60s uh, um, vibe, you know, where I go back to sort of Alan Silito maybe and... Uh, um, loneliness, long distance runner, and that sort of thing. Um, was were, were those sort of films a uh, influence to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wrote a book about. I wrote a book called Welcome to the Cheap Seats, which was all about um, kind of a, a brief history of working class cinema, for, for want of a better term, really. But yeah, definitely, he's looking at. All of those kind of films, particularly those kind of late 50s, early 60s films like Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, Loneliness of a Long Distance Runner, Taste of Honey, you know, and not, not, and I think as well, you know, going all the way back, if you look at one of the things I touched upon in the book was someone like Chaplin, who we mentioned earlier on. Now, you know, he's someone who went on to be arguably the biggest kind of film star of that time ever, you know. Um, but, you know, he started off as a South London lad, lived in absolute poverty and uh, was able to uh, overcome that and become this kind of uh, immigrant who represented the American dream. But, I mean, much later on, obviously, that, that turned on him. And 
the authorities kind of got rid of him. But um, but if you look at the, the early Chaplin stuff, you know things like uh, uh, Modern Times, it's uh, you know still a classic and 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 resonates very much with what what's happening in today's society, definitely. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it always fascinates me. But it's the language of those kind of kitchen scenes dramas as well i mean like you say it's always been you know it's that more naturalist approach and uh, it, but it's also very poetic as well you know a lot of what Arthur Seaton says on saturday night Monday morning so Casilito wrote the script as well it's 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 beautifully written beautiful oh beautifully written and uh, i remember seeing it as a kid and uh, thinking this is something that represents me because I'd not seen representations of, of Nottingham, representations of working class uh, before. So uh, you know, not on television, you know, it, it all seemed so glamorous, didn't it? And I quite liked all the glamour uh, um, that I saw on the television and it was another world, you know, one to escape to. But there was something um, very affecting about um, seeing your own situation, um, uh, you know, reflected back. And I remember... Um, the moment in uh, the uh, loneliness of the long distance runner where he stops running that took my breath away mm. and and the idea of losing on your own terms as opposed to um on other people's terms um uh, and their perception of you winning i i thought was something that stayed with me for the rest of my life um, I mean, very poetic in, in you know, far more than, the, you know, a lot of the films that, that wash through you uh, and a lot of the TV that washes through you. That, as I say, I, I must have seen that 50 years ago and, you know, the image um, and the, the point of it um, stayed with me. Well, I, yeah, I mean... Because, you know, Arthur Seaton, obviously, in Saturday night, Sunday morning, seems this, you know, very rebellious character. And he, he, I mean, and you still have that at the end of the film where he's threatening to throw stones through another window, you know, so he's not, not the last one I'll throw. But but, all, but Colin Smith in uh, Loneliness of the Long Distance, he's much more rebellious in a, in a true sense. You know, he gives up everything to, to retain his integrity. And it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a staggeringly good film. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It, it is, and, and uh, only from a short story, really. So, you okay, know, yeah. uh, um, I, I think that's probably helps the the focus on that one sort of moment that, that it, it, they're, they're not trying to uh, pour a, a mammoth uh, story into an hour and a half, because obviously, as we've seen lots of novels uh, made into, uh, into films, very often, you know, because of the, the nature of you're only going to watch a film for two hours, maybe two and a half, um, they, they can uh, miss a lot of the book. Mm. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I think... I, I do think, you know, with Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, though, obviously it's based on, on on the novel as well, but I think, obviously, they couldn't get away with quite as much that happens in the novel, but it's still it's yeah. really groundbreaking for the time. And like it was like being punched in the face, you know, a fist coming out of their silver screen. Uh, and, and just and but also I think taste of honey as well. I mean that yeah. that's you know that's still amazing to think that you know Sheila Delaney was eighteen when she wrote that. You know she she was this yeah. you know this yeah. daughter of a working class you know his family and and th- there are issues in even though it doesn't feel like loads of issues it feels like a natural story but there are issues within taste of honey which would have average Daily Mail reader, their, their toes will be curling up now if you release that film today. Yeah, but yeah, to release yeah. that in 1962, it was, it was incredible. Yeah, in, in some ways, um, those films, because they were so stark, um, um, were far more um, political than a lot of things these days where it's it's it, it, it's eased in, you know, they're, they're, it's manipulated and, uh, and uh, cosseted. Uh, rather than being presented star, I, I love um, uh, Man at the Top and uh, yeah. El Room. I, I, I love yeah. all those uh, uh, those films. I, I think Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, being from Nottingham, is particularly uh, interesting. And, that, and as you say, that line, um, it won't be the last stone I'll throw. Um, whenever I hear it, my my heart goes. Uh, um, it's 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 
there's something I'm starting to well up now, Andrew. There's something um, very emotive about um, about it in in a uh, not a violent sense, but in a a sense of um, refusing to be beaten. Yeah, uh, and I, I love that. I love that in in the film. And it's you know uh, of all the lessons we learn through films, it's uh, it's a great lesson to learn. And I think the key moment, because you've got all these classic lines in Saturday Night and Sunday Morning that, you know, obviously people talk about now and quote, you know, all these classic Arthur Seaton lines. But one of the most telling lines is one that's not often quoted, but it's where he looks in the mirror towards the end after he's been beaten up by the squaddies and says, you know, I don't know who, he, you know, he sort of says, I don't know who I am. And that's that's the key to the character, that he has, he's prop, having a proper existential crisis. Yes, I know that uh, the beginning of that film uh, was written specifically. It's not actually in the book, is it? The the, the big speech he does at the beginning, and uh, um, I, I used to tour with a pop group called uh, Digby's Drill, uh, Sheffield band, and they used to play that yeah. speech before they went on stage, and it was so stirring. And they used to play it really loud, and then they'd come in with the, the chords at the end and, and go into their first song. Um, it's in a magnificent uh, speech, um, you know, and to, to think that it was written just specifically because they needed uh, a start for the film. Mm. I mean, yeah. very poetic, or, you know, it'd, it'd be lovely to, to write something as, you know, as, as visceral as that, um, you know, as, as a poem. I did meet uh, Alan Silito. Um, uh, I put him on at the Manchester uh, Poetry Festival years ago. And, um, uh, and the lovely thing was, it was a poetry festival. Uh, and he came up to Manchester and we paid him uh, a few hundred uh, pounds. And um, he said, I'm not reading poems. I'm going to read me short stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I loved his belligerence. <laughs> what are you Welsh you're going to expect from Alan Silito? <laughs> So I was going to read you uh, one of my poems, uh, and uh, I, I, um, I got back into poetry um, by looking at uh, photos. So I'd, I'd had a break. I, I worked in television for uh, about 20 years, and um, well, 20 to 30, uh, obviously the writing and, and then the production, but in production for about 20 years. And um, what got me back in was looking at photos of my son, uh, um, and uh, and uh, I finding that I I was very emotional about this image, and I, what, what I'm thinking about is that we're talking here about images, moving images, and we're talking about poetic images. And this was a still image, uh, and um, and one of the first ones was um, of of an anchor, uh, and um, it's an anchor that's on the Brighton seafront, and it's huge. And my son, when he was about three, we, we were there and we took a, a photo and I've got a photo of, of my son, uh, it's three, and we just found out that he was autistic. So uh, there's a lot of connotations um, flying around my brain. And, and I wrote this poem, it's called Anchor. There is something about a sense of scale. A small anchor is commonplace, almost a toy, but a real size anchor from a real life ship the sheer weight is impressive, immovable, no tide or wind can pull it away. Exhumed from the deep, it lies there like a heart exposed. That's amazing. And uh, I was trying to, because uh, um, I was up until recently, I was, I was doing, I was teaching a poetry module at, um, uh, De Montfort University, um, and and I, I I I'm not just saying this, but I, I used a lot of your poetry in it as 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 an exam example. God bless you. The, the check will be in the post, will it? Uh, but I I I was trying to kind of because it was a performance poetry module I was doing, and I was trying to get across the 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 fact that. You know, you can do that big bombastic performance, and some people are great at that. But I think what what is key to you, Henry, I mean, obviously it works on the page, but it, there's such, when you are performing, uh, it, it's such a, there is obviously humour, you use humour in it, but it's, there's such a warmth. You can't, 
I, I, I couldn't emulate that if I tried. It's, 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 it's so, there's something so touching and moving. And whatever you do is, is just, I, I, I could sit and watch, you know, I have, I've, I've performed with you. And oh, that's, very, that's very kind. I, I, was, I was with Lem Sisse yesterday. He, he is, um, he's doing the Brighton Festival and uh, we were sat talking about old times. And it reminded me uh, that it was great to have met him when I was younger, uh, and he was about, uh, he must have been about 19 when I met him, and, and I was uh, about 10 years older, about 29, um, because he had this thing, he had this way of performing that he lived the poem, and we've talked about this since, and, and he says, you, you have to live the poem, you have to be in the poem, you have to feel the poem, otherwise, you know, you're, you're just reciting it like an actor. Uh, and, it, and it obviously means more to the poet than it does to the actor. And I, what I've noticed with actors is is they they project, and and they they tend to go up at the end as to be like a big dramatic finish. Whereas a lot of poems are actually they're they're, an, they're a dialogue inside, and and a lot of poems I find um, they don't go up at the end because there's almost a sigh. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, as as you reach a conclusion, uh, uh, you know, um, very often. I mean, that that's what I'd call a single image poem. That I'm looking at a single image, but even with a, um, uh, several images, very often you're building to um, some understanding, and and the understanding is not necessarily, a, you know, a, accompanied by a trumpet. It's you know, it's a, um, it's a resignation, shall we say? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think that's that's really true about living the poem, absolutely. And I think because you know poetry should be there to to incorporate lots of different emotions, and if we're angry, then she channel that into poetry as as much as writing about the nice things. But I think temptation is to write something which is maybe blatantly political, which is not necessarily going to affect your audience in the same way that if you present them with a narrative or a story that they can engage with, which touches upon the same things, but it's, it, it's it, you know, you're presenting them with something much more universally human than a political viewpoint. Oh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I have a sort of a rule, I'm, I'm sure you uh, you have your own internal rules. One, one of mine is that um, I, I have to write something that nobody else would write. It has yeah. to be from my point of view. The, the great thing is that you're an expert on your own world. Uh, you know, your own life, your own inner world. Uh, um, so that's what you need to to concentrate on, because nobody can write those those better. So you, you do uh, you you do workshops and 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 teaching. Um, how are you finding that with the um, the pandemic? Uh, has that been difficult? Well, um, mostly. I mean, a lot of the workshop stuff I was doing before uh, COVID. I mean, that, that was kind of just going ahead. But um, obviously, when COVID hit. Um, I could kind of see that immediately. There was no point in moaning about it. The world had changed overnight. So I was able to shift focus and just redouble my efforts in terms of writing films. So, so writing about films. So I, you know, just wrote more magazines and I, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate I've been able to earn a living doing that. Um, um, I, I, I did do, I did a certain amount of stuff online. I, I was doing, um, I do a lot of mentoring for, for younger poets and writers. So I've done a lot of that. And um, I've been involved with an organisation called First Story for the last six years, um, where that, that incorporates me being made writer in residence in a particular school. And, and this year it happens to be Clifton Academy in Farnborough. So I go out once a week and I work with, uh, I'm really lucky, you know, I get to work with a bunch of kids and we work, I get them to write things. And then and then at the end of the year, they have uh, an anthology of their work published. Um, so that has kind of just started again. So for the last seven weeks, I've been going out, physically going out to Clifton, um, which has been, which was really odd at first, having had a year where I'd not really been anywhere to go into a school. But it's it's been done really safely, um, but it's been lovely. I'd, I'd, for, I'd, I'd forgotten how much I missed it and going out and work, working with kids, especially doing poetry. I would love to see, I would love to see you and, uh, and the kids 
uh, do something at the next Nottingham Poetry Festival. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be gorgeous. We should talk about that uh, later. And Because uh, I, I know that's... I, I started um, because, you know, somebody asked me to read a, a, a poem. And uh, um, I think if you've tutored them, uh, you know, the, the, it may be very enhancing uh, for them to do that. Um, can, you, can you give us another poem? Because I'd like to get a few of your poems in uh, within the hour. Yeah, um, I'll I'll do because we've been talking about films. Um, I think I will do this one, um, which is about one of my favourite film stars, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and this this is simply called Marilyn. You were gone, not just gone, but Hollywood gone. Like you'd always been, never really there. Look alike, box set, poster. The pin up girl we tried to pin down in a newsreel kiss, a lipstick curse, miscarrying into childless ache when some like it hot ran cold. Barbiturate bombshell blown to smithereens, peroxide pieces scattered at a playground's edge. You were star and rumour, shimmer and shadow, skirt and steam, dirt and dream, magic, misfit, Norma Jean. Oh, that's great. That's, uh, that's great. Um, now, does it, is that in one of your books, and that in uh, Save, the, Save the Team? No, that's going to be in the next one. The, uh, the next not, one. So what's, not, what's the next one called? Uh, not Dancing with Ingrid Pitt. Not Dancing with Ingrid Pitt. That, that's out when? August. August. Published August, by Bernie. That's going to be August. Books. So is it available to pre, pre-order yet? I don't think it's available to pre-order yet. It will be fairly shortly, but it's not available to pre-order now. All right. So, so coming soon from Bur- Burning Eye Books. Yes. Uh, and you, you did say you, when we uh, chatted before the uh, the Zoom that uh, people can buy books from you. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, if they want to. I mean, you can buy sort of Light at the End of the Tenor or God Save the Team in terms of poetry books. You can buy them direct from... And how, how do we do that? Uh, where, where do we contact you? Or, or you can get it from me. Um, you can contact me through, just through Facebook. If you message me on Facebook, um, Andrew Graves, just on Facebook. And uh, if you want one... Uh, if you want me to sign a copy for you, I can get that to you, and we can. And, and I know you're on you're on Twitter as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, are you on Instagram? Yeah, but I don't I don't I don't I don't do it very often. I, I don't go on Instagram very often. Um, All right. I I, I I am on Instagram. Yeah. I'm told that's where the kids are. Well, yeah, this is which is why I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, I started doing a thing on Instagram where, um, uh, because I, I did some poems that related to um, uh, photos, uh, yeah. I thought, well, they would work well on Instagram. So I've put the photos up and I put uh, the, the poem next to it. Um, and uh, so I've quite enjoyed that. I think you've got to use each platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It they, is. They've all got separate personalities haven't they they have they have uh, t- twitter um uh, I, I love doing twitter but it's sort of got a five minute um, attention span hasn't it twitter yeah. Yeah. whereas facebook uh, it's got about a three day uh, attention span i would say yeah. uh, a, a very wise goldfish yeah instagram's yeah. a bit pouty isn't it it's a bit pouty is it <laughs> I, I'm going to read you a poem that I put on uh, Instagram. Uh, this is, um, uh, again, it's, uh, it's, it's from an image. So this is an image of, uh, in Ireland, a, um, a balcony. And, uh, and the photo is a photo of uh, my son sitting on the balcony. Uh, and uh, I've, I've moved off the balcony at this point and I'm taking the photo. It's called A View to Die For. If this balcony collapses, I'm extinct but it's a risk I take casually. This ageless vista is essential to a life wholly lived. When my wife and son join me, I'm a little more conscious of odds and consequences. When he starts banging the side, I begin to feel increasingly mortal, the scenery becoming less vital. 
with each blow. It's beautiful. Yeah. No, I think what we'll do. We'll take some. Uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, if anybody's got any questions for uh, for Andrew, uh, or even for me, uh, uh, but uh, for Andrew mainly. Uh, um, uh, send them through. Now, uh, when you're doing a question, don't make it a big, light, long one, because of course I, I, I'm not very good at reading off the uh, the screen. A nice, nice short question, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll crack on. Let's have a look. Hello. I, I, I think I'm muted myself. Then, can you hear me now, Andrew? Yes. Yes, I'll, I'll say that again. Uh, um, of all the poems you've written, do you have a current favourite and why? Um, oh, blimey. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I, I've got... My, my favourite poem I've ever written, I think, is one called Home. Uh, uh, just, just I, I don't know, just, I don't know why, it just, just reson it still resonates with me. I'm, I, you know, and I don't mean to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but, you know, sometimes when you look back at things that you wrote, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, and you think, yeah. you, you, sometimes I think, who, who was I when I wrote that? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I wish, I wish, I'm, I'm not sure he's still there anymore, but I'm glad he was there then, you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I will, we change all the time, though, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and thank goodness uh, you wouldn't want to be stuck. Um, I, I, I often think to myself, if I think back at any point in my life and then try to think who I'm going to be in two years' time, I don't think I would ever have guessed what I was capable of or what what I was doing at that time. I, th I think uh, life continually surprises you, and I think our personal growth. I think continually surprises, and uh, it's a beautiful thing that that, that happens. Um, and uh, now uh, another question somebody's asked is, um, what uh, what's the weirdest place you've performed? A cow shed. A cow shed. Okay. Well, can you remember we did that. We did that together. It was a converted. Oh yes, to yes, we did. Yes, that's right. <laughs> In Belper. In Belper, yes, yeah. Well, that, that was that was that was quite weird. Uh, nice though. It's lovely. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice. I really yeah. enjoyed. Good gig. Uh, yeah. A lovely audience. Uh, there, there was an element of Bethlehem about it. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I went on first, I, I must be John the Baptist to your Jesus. Well, it's a nasty room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's good. Now, I, I, so, uh, do I have a favourite poem? So. I, I, I think the, my favourite changes every now and again. Um, I, I, there's a poem I'm going to do at the end, which is uh, one of me, uh, one of my favourites. But um, it's a bit like albums, isn't it? Like, you know, you different albums for different moods, and I would imagine same with films for you as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. yeah. Now I've got a question for you. What film have you watched the most times? Because here's the thing. This, this, that, that's uh, um, a practical question. Whereas you say, what's your best favorite film? There's all sorts of uh, ways you can think about that, but there's going to be one film that you've watched more times than any other. What is that? Mm, well, it's probably, um, it's probably going to be either um, Harvey starring Jimmy Stewart or uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And it's probably it's a wonderful life because you know I just regularly watch it. I've, I've definitely watched it at Christmas for the last twenty five years. So so I, I've seen it at least twenty five times, but probably more than that in terms of. Let me ask, let me ask you something about that because I've seen it a few times and I find it. I know we, I know it's very upbeat at the end, but I find it um, quite an odd watch in the basically the bloke. As a hard time and self sacrifices throughout the film, and mm. I, I just want to shake him and say, "Life's short, mm. you know. Do, do have some pleasure for yourself. Even Jesus had, uh, you know, uh, uh, had oil on him at one point. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, do, 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 you know, have some. It, it seems very, very much a, a, a slight misery fest until we get to the end." 
Well, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, I always say, I mean, I love it. You know, it just does make, you know, it just give you that kind of warm glow at the end. But the idea, I think, I think it's judged by a lot of people that have never really seen it. And they see it as this schmaltzy thing. But it's nice. You know, it's about a man who's driven to suicide by a corrupt banking system. It's not much more relevant than well, that. I, I, see, I, I, see it, I see it deeper. I see it's about a man who basically has deferred all his pleasure throughout his life and, and has sacrificed himself for others. And that's a worthy thing to do. But I, I think he's done it so much that there's none of him left. What, but also what's brave about it is, is that, you know, Mr. Potts, this, this horrible villain, he never gets his confidence. He just, <laughs> he, you know, he just, he just gets away at the end. You yeah. know? Also, yeah. this part of me, because I've seen it so many times, and, and yeah. so I think you can play with it, I think. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, Pottersville, the alternative world, but this, yeah. that, it looks loads better. <laughs> the town he's actually living in. I would much more. I would, I would definitely live in Pottersville. Yeah, I, I, the film I've watched the most times. Um, there's two that are competing, but I, um, one is um, Midnight Run with yeah, Robert yeah. De Niro and Charles Grodin. I know oh, Charles yeah. Grodin's died yeah. uh, very, very, very recently. Um, and there's something. It's a comedy, but there's something very tender about it uh, and the relationship between the two blokes. And the scene that always affects me is when Robert De Niro goes to see his uh, wife and, and the daughter appears. Uh, do, you, do you know this film? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it many times. Uh, yes. and, and his daughter appears, and he hasn't seen her uh, since she was a, a small child, and, um, and he can't think of what to say. And I think that's such a brave scene because... At times like that, you might you might not be able to know what to say, and and the fact that the words can't come to him, I find so incredibly moving and painful. Yeah, it's a great film. That is, it's really entertaining. But like you say, it's got these uh, these odd little moments in as well. And it's you know that if 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 you don't believe that relationship between those two characters as well, the two central characters, it it's it's kind of over. And I think it's it's good because. You know, De Niro's not, you know, I think he has done a few comedy films which not really worked, but I think in that, because he's not really trying, he's not trying to be the comedy character, he's trying to be the character he's, you know, that kind of... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's, yeah. he's, 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 he's the um, he's the slight sort of uh, unknowing idiot, whereas yeah. Charles Grodin is, is as you say, uh, as the comic attitude uh, of knowing that he's an idiot, but, uh, but biding his time. Uh, um, the other the other film uh, that I've seen lots and lots and lots is uh, Falling Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so no, yeah, and it's a yeah, really good again. Another. And I tell you what, I tell you what I like about it. It's a story of two men, mm. uh, and one man uh, can cope with the modern world, and, and one man can't. Uh, um, and there's a line in it where um, the main character, Michael Douglas, character sees. Uh, somebody of a, in a similar position. It's, it's a black man, uh, um, but he's dressed the same as Michael Douglas. And he's no longer he, economically, not, no longer economically viable. No longer. And you know, I, I want to weep every time I see that. There's something about the injustice of it yeah. that is so well captured in that moment uh, between the two men that. Um, it's great uh, cinema for that, uh, yeah. um, and and uh, creativity in general. To actually, uh, somebody can talk you blue in the face, but then when you see something like the images we've been talking about today um, uh, in film, uh, you don't you don't have to over talk it. it, it that that the moment says everything that you need, and I think we try to capture that sometimes in poetry, don't we? Yeah, I, yeah, and I think as well. Um, in that film, it's the relationship between Robert Duval and his wife as well. I mean, that again, going back to that sacrifice, that ultimate sacrifice he's making, you know, he's he's taking all this rubbish at work and you know, all these kind of insults, but it's basically so he can look after his wife. Yeah. Uh, yeah it is, it's lovely. Uh, um brought us brought a tear to me like that, Andrew. Uh, uh, just talking about them. Um it's funny how, how we can be moved by um uh, by what is essentially uh, creativity uh, um 
and uh, to a certain degree made up. Um, I often think we draw upon things so that there's a, a reality and a truth in everything that we make up. Um, now, um, have you got another poem for us? Yes, yes, uh, I can uh, do another poem. Um, I, I'm going to do this one. This is only, it's only a fairly short poem, but this is the, I think, you know, everybody, well, I say everybody, a lot of people, I think, tried to write sort of COVID poems, and I, I didn't, I deliberately tried not to do that, but I ended up writing something about kind of the symptom, I guess, of, of, of what happened during COVID, and I think, because I know, I know a few people that kind of, split up and got divorced during COVID because of the pressures they were put under. Um, so I kind of wrote that, um, this about that. Uh, this is called Home Front. Talks collapse, tensions escalate, and insults drop like missiles from the sky. Negotiations fail again. They retreat to opposite ends of the sofa, Leatherette between them, a no man's land. Coffee table, neutral territory, where undrunk teacups barricade the bomb site of their love. No, oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's an old uh, new experience, isn't it, COVID? Mm. Uh, I'm going to read you a, a, a daft poem that I've written uh, uh, just a, a few weeks ago because I had my second jab. Uh, All right. okay. And uh, this is called uh, 15 Ways to Leave Your Lockdown. <laughs> Based, obviously, on the Paul Simon song. Uh, I, I couldn't do 50. Uh, I thought that would be too long a poem. There we go. 15 Ways to Leave Your Lockdown. Get the vaccine, Maxine. Get the Pfizer, Eliza. Get your shot, Dot, before you cannot. Get your jabs, Babs. Get your AstraZeneca, Annika. Inoculate, Kate. Don't hesitate. Get Johnson & Johnson, Bronson. Get it in your vein, Lorraine. Immunise, guys. Pay no attention to lies. Get the Moderna, Verna. Get it in your capillary, Hillary. It's just a prick, Mick. So don't get sick. Curtail the virus, Cyrus. Stop the disease, Louise. Vaccinate, Nate, before it's too late. <laughs> I remember, because you posted that on Facebook, didn't you, a few weeks ago? I did. Ago. I did. Yeah. I did. I, I like I, I like um, I like messing and playing and and amusing myself uh, as much as anything because I often think if if um, if when you do a poetry reading and I know you do entire shows you'd like do an hour and a half uh, shows um, you've got to have light and shade haven't you yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, and you, you don't want everybody uh, you know buying the books and slitting the wrists with the pages. So you, you need to uh, to like now. There's a lot of humour in uh, in a lot of your uh, um, work that I've uh, I've witnessed. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You can't, you, you know, <clears throat> and I think as well uh, in terms of performing. I guess I think for me, I mean, you're obviously you know very expert at this, but it, it, it's that I I think it's your patter between. That's yeah. as I re I rehearse as on that as much as I do the poems, you know, that's the thing I, I yeah. stand in front of the mirror doing. Do you? <laughs> no, I, you know, I can't stand it. I'm, 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 I'm too old to be standing in front of the mirror. Uh, I, you know, I, even to shave, I find it a, a, a chore these days. Um, maybe when I was younger and a bit uh, more vain. Uh, but now, nowadays, I, I either see me elder brother or me dad. <laughs> uh, now, um... I know you're doing uh, some work for Inspire. Uh, to, to tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I've been doing, uh, I've done loads of stuff for lots of projects with Inspire, but the um, uh, latest one I'm doing is, um, I'm, I'm kind of part of this bigger project called Lost Words, which is uh, via Knott's Trent University and a lady called Natalie Braber, which is about bringing artworks together and words of dialect, local dialect, and going out into schools and other places and encouraging people to write around dialect. So I'm doing that, but then Inspire have kind of commissioned me separately to write a brand new poem about um, the local dialect. So I'm yeah. going to be working on that fairly soon. And also I think as part of it, there will be... Um, 
there'll be some like online um, exercises and, and, and prompts that I'll be putting out there so that people, you know, can uh, create their own poetry based on the prompts I'm going to put out there. So that'll be happening in the next few months. So if people want to look out for that lost words, it's going to be called Through yeah. Inspiring. And, and um, uh, we were talking earlier about some of the lost words that, that I remember. Um, I certainly, uh, when I was a kid, uh, um, I think the word pavement seems to have come from America. I'm not sure, yeah. but we, we would call it the Corsi. Corsi, yeah. 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 And, and, uh, and, and uh, I know there's a, there's a lot of different um, uh, words uh, for... Uh, uh, entry or ginnel yeah um, and what would you say as a kid I, I, we we because it's slightly different because i think from not nottingham slightly different to nottinghamshire you know mansfield yeah. and something so i would say general general is what, what i would yeah say. yeah uh, well i mean that's a, a version and there's so many versions of uh, uh, you know different different names that in in um uh in hall when i lived in hall for a while um they had what was called a ten foot because it had to be 10 foot wide, so they'd call that a 10 foot. Uh, and so all over the country, they've got different versions of, uh, of, of different names. Um, and the, the other word that nobody in the South seems to understand is uh, Nesh. Nesh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my wife's Nesh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for, for those who don't know, because uh, there's people here, uh, outside Nottingham listening to this, um, it's uh, it's somebody that um, uh, is susceptible to the cold. So you'd say, put a vest on your Nash bugger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but uh, I say, I, I don't, don't hear, hear it. Um, I know uh, um, uh, I, when I worked with uh, Steve Coogan, he used to say that some of my poems only rhyme in a Nottingham accent. <laughs> Because, yeah. uh, you know, obviously he, he would... Uh, he's very good at accents. And uh, in, in the... Uh, I don't know whether you ever saw the programme um, Saxondale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where he was in East Midlands. He's well, yeah, he basically one, stole, yeah. stole a bit of my accent in that. Uh, and, uh, you know, as he does, a bit of other people's and, uh, and made up a, a character. Um, but he's very good at uh, accents. Um, and it's, it's quite amazing how... Um, these words that we use and and the the accents that we have um they're, they're not there at birth they're something we acquire yeah, uh, yeah. And, and even when we go like you know i've lived in uh, in brighton now for uh, 24 years um but i can't i can't lose the accent at all well it's uh because because I do a lot of work in schools and stuff, so you, you, and I and I used to do youth work years ago. Kind of a lot of the I've I've rounded a lot of the edges, I think. But immediately when I'm back with my mates from people I grew up with in Stutton and Mansfield and stuff, I it it, it becomes thicker the more I spend yeah. time with them. So yeah, so I don't think you ever lose it, you know. No. It's still um, it's gold fingers on in our eyes. It's, it's still goat finger. Goat finger, yes. I've got some uh, comments here. Somebody said Snickleway is, uh, um, and in Yorkshire, Nesh means uh, cold or cowardly. Ooh. There you go. Uh, um, so um, you've uh, you've got a new book coming out. Uh, you got um, a book about um, the cinema. Yep. Um, uh, are you working on a new stage play at all? No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> you got enough to do. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm working on a new film book at the minute. So that that's coming out um, later this year. So uh, and then I've just been um, commissioned for another publisher to write another film book, which I'm working on at the moment. So and I've got. Tons of magazines, stuff I'm working on at the minute. So I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm just writing every day, basically. So it's, it, it's lovely to be paid for that. But yeah, it's just constant stream of writing commissions and, and working constantly. Yeah. yeah and and all, all this behind you, this, uh, this is, uh, this is all your uh, DVDs. Yeah, my DVDs and my Blu-rays and my film books and everything. And I've got, you can't see it, but above here, there's just film books and things as well. So, yeah, it's my little office where I just work and I've got everything in here I need to access. So in terms of research and all that kind of malarkey. So, yeah, yeah it's all my nice little uh, man cave set up. Uh, 
And I, I love the I love the fact that you uh, you, you you stayed in today, but you've you've still got a tie and a. Oh yeah, never never surrender. That's you know I, <laughs> you know I, I I love clothes and I love um and I, I always have done and uh, I I did a few months of shuffling around in my tracksuit bottoms, but I, I can't do it. And I need to I need to dress up. I, it feels natural to me. You know, I, I used to do a thing. Uh, I did find myself um, in the garden with my slippers on. And, <laughs> and, and it, it reminded me of an old lady who used to walk down our street and she always used to go up to the fine fair in an overcoat and slippers. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I thought, oh, no, I've, be, I've become I've become her. Uh, um, so uh, so I've, 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 uh, I've, I draw the line of that. But uh, um, Have you got your A slippers and your B slippers? No, well, no, no, well, I've got more than one pair of slippers. Yes, yeah. so, no, I'm not. I'm not labelled a man and B. I suppose there's one that I like more than t'other. Uh, um, but uh, I, I, um, I did a thing at the, when uh, lockdown first started that I, I used to go to the shops. I used to dress up to go to the shops because I thought if I dress up to go to the shops, then I, I know I'm not going to be wearing that when I get home. I can take it off, you know, and I know I don't need it. Yeah. So, so, um, and also, people treat you very nice if you dress up when you get to Asda. They do, yeah. I, it's, I, it's, like, it's like it's it's like royalty's arrived. <laughs> from this, so because I've got a, I've got a couple of Baker Boy hats. I love Baker Boy hats, but obviously they've just become synonymous with Peaky Blinders now. But for me, <laughs> Baker Boy hat is a, yeah. you know, it's the sting. That's that's why I got a Baker Boy hat. So it annoys me a bit. It's like always oh, got a Peaky Blinders hat on. No, it's 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 Robert Redford in the sting. <laughs> Uh, now um, we're, we're about time to do uh, um, a couple of poems. So, uh, have you got a last poem for us? Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll I'll do the one I said was my favourite one of mine. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that for us. This is called uh, Home. If there's no light at the end of this tenor, I'll warm myself in your poverty. Lend myself to your bank of trust. Hand you broken bulbs of hope and watch as you make them glow. And see artworks in the damp patches, fairy tales in the final warnings, peeling dreams of wallpaper, love feel, drafts of whispered sweet regards. And know this crumbling terrace is our palace in the making. Know these missing tiles are our windows onto heaven. Know the rubbish telly is a reason to go to bed with you. Know those tangled weeds outside are flowers of romance. And know the knackered heating is why we cuddle up at night. Know the dripping tap is the beating of a heart. And know the siren rushing by is music of the night. A flashing blue light overture, a rhapsody of ravaged hymns. Because if there's no light at the end of this tenor, then I'll warm myself in your poverty, lend myself to your bank of trust. Hand you broken bulbs of hope and watch as you make them glow, as you make them glow. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, that's, that's beautiful, that. Um, I shall be keeping in touch on Twitter and Facebook and uh, occasionally on Instagram. Uh, and um, uh, thanks for being my guest today. Um, so I've got 10 of these. Um, uh, so uh, do join me uh, next uh, week. Um, I forgot who it is next week. Um, uh, it, it'll be on Inspire if you go on Inspire. Um, I, I've normally got my list with me, but I, I'm not today. Very uh, unprofessional. Um, is, it, is it Anne next week? Is it Anne? Yeah, Anne. Anne Holloway next week. Anne Holloway, yeah. that's right. Thank, oh, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, poet and prompt. I'm, li I'm liking that. Anne Holloway, yes, who uh, has yeah, now become the, um, the the new creative director of the uh, Nottingham Poetry Festival. So I'm looking forward to chatting to her. She also runs uh, a press uh, in Nottingham, and uh, she's a very intelligent woman and poet, um, but also does lots and lots of different things 
um, for, for us to chat about. So um, I shall be talking to her. Um, uh, thanks again to uh, Metronome uh, uh, and uh, Confetti for hosting us today and sorting out all the techs. Thanks uh, to the tech guy. Uh, um, and thank you um, to Inspire. Uh, and the Knotts Libraries and the Nottingham County Council for uh, sorting this out. And you will be able to see Bridie Squires um, uh, if you go onto their website. And that, that's, uh, um, I'll say, the first one we did. It's an hour there. And all these, and this one will be eventually put up there. Um, and thank you to the Nottingham Poetry Festival um, and uh, the Arts Council. And, 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 uh, and, and to you. Thank you for uh, staying with us. Um, this is uh, one of my favourite poems. I've got it on a bit of paper here. Um, it's called Twice As Many Hydrogen Atoms As Oxygen Moving. And uh, again, uh, what I've done today is uh, I tried to do, I want to do different poems every, every time. So um, uh, I chose all my Instagram poems today. So that if you go on Instagram, you'll see some of these up there. Um, so this is based on a photo, and it's a photo of my son uh, in Portugal. Uh, on the beach, and uh, it's just a, a, a moment that was captured. Um, twice as many hydrogen atoms as oxygen moving. I don't need to see his face to know it's him. The light has its own plans. In reality, nothing is still, as elements complete. A split second away, there is another poem. If I want, I can see a trail of silver at the spill, or the ominous underbelly of distant concentrations. Everything I see is a reflection of this love. I can home in on the dislocation of arms in motion, or glory in the contrast of chemistry as liquid and gas. We may not see the same world at all. I hope yours is as full of splendour. 